close to your stream. So this kind of functionality can be taken care of by using libav filter. So moving on, now how this FFmpeg source code will be compiled or from where this can be fetched. So basically FFmpeg source code has been developed with Git. Git is nothing, it's just a source version control system. So a user can retrieve FFmpeg source code using Git client. So a user has to install Git client on its on his or her Linux machine and can just do a git clone have shared the URL from this URL a user can can just do a git clone and it will be able to retrieve the FFmpeg source code. So once you have downloaded the source code you need to check your machine you need to see what are the different dependencies for FFmpeg. So before configuration and compilation do install all the dependencies. There could be a lot of dependencies depending upon the kind of codecs you want to use or the kind of platform on which you are compiling FFmpeg. So once you have installed all the dependencies, you have, take, you have taken care of all the dependencies, a user can configure FFmpeg source code depending upon the requirement, the kind of codecs it wants to support. Like I've taken a typical example where I've taken enable libx264. So libx264 is is an h.264 encoder library. So depending upon the usage, a user can configure FFmpeg accordingly. By using this, it, the footprint of the source code will reduce. So it again, you can, it again gives a advantage on saving the memory. So once the FFmpeg FFmpeg is configured, the FFmpeg binaries and libraries can be generated by by giving a make command, which is a standard way of compiling on a Linux machine. So moving on to the next slide. We have seen how FFmpeg can be compiled. Now how FFmpeg is used by multimedia players. Uh, as we know that FFmpeg is hosted over Git. So there are multiple repositories which are maintained by, by different multimedia application developers. For example, let's take a case of mplayer. So once you try to try to check out or compile mplayer, so while doing that mplayer checks out the latest FFmpeg source code and while compiling, it compiles against the latest code. You can also configure mplayer, like in case you want to use, you want to have a GUI. So you can use a parameter enable GUI and you can have a graphical user interface. Again, based on the usage, codec libraries needs to be compiled and installed separately. Another very popular multimedia player nowadays is XBMC. XBMC in the code, checking out the code, checking out code from from uh, FFmpeg Git repo. XBMC maintains a copy of FFmpeg as part of XBMC repository. So XBMC can also be configured using external FFmpeg. Let's say you have your own FFmpeg in which you have integrated hardware codecs and you want to make use of them. So you can just compile XBMC by using a flag enable external FFmpeg and the XBMC will make use of external FFmpeg which you have already compiled in your system. So in this way it gives a flexibility to the user. So let us now see some use cases of FFmpeg. FFmpeg, there could be multiple use cases, but primarily I'll be covering two specific use cases. One is transcode and other is streaming. The decode and playback use case is kind of an implicit use case. 
So while transcoding, I'll cover decode and playback as well. So that is why I haven't mentioned that uh, explicitly. So let us see how a multimedia transcode takes place. First, what is actually a transcoding? Transcoding is direct digital to digital data conversion from one format to another format. What is the need of being a transcoding? Transcoding is usually done in cases where a target device does not support the format or has limited storage capacity. So with limited storage capacity, it becomes a compulsion, a mandate to reduce the size of the content. Or another scenario could be that, that the multimedia file, the codec supported by that multimedia file is incompatible or it, ha it has obsolete data. So in order to convert it to better supported or a modern format, transcoding is required. So these are basically some typical use cases of why transcoding is necessary. So this diagram depicts a pipeline kind of an architecture used for transcoding. The input stream, it goes to the demuxer. What demuxer does is it extracts the elementary streams for both audio and video. The input stream is basically in the form of a container. So it, the stream contains an audio format as well as a video format. So what a demuxer does is demuxer extracts the elementary streams for audio and video from that container format. Then these elementary streams are fed to decoders. The audio and the video decoder, they handle the compressed elementary stream and output the uncompressed raw data. The raw data for audio is, is in form of, a, of PCM data and in case of video, it is YU format. There could be multiple types of this YU format like NV12. And same goes for PCM, it could be LPCM or there are a lot of other formats. The raw format will consist of decoded frames and it will, in case of video, it will also have associated timestamps with, with all I, P and B frames. The raw data goes to video post processor. In video post processor, certain, certain processes like changing of bitrate, image resizing, motion adaptiveness, color space conversion, all these things takes place in video post processor. Like in case of a decode and a decode and a playback kind of a use case, we don't need to have a full pipeline. We can work with a partial partial pipeline. The post process data is fed to the renderer. In renderer audio and video sync take place. And after audio and video sync, this data is given to multimedia application. The multimedia application then renders it on various output ports which are connected to that particular device on which that multimedia application is playing. Some typical output ports could be HDMI or I to a zero. And in turn, that HDMI could be connected to a television or to a major system. So in that way, we get a playback using partial pipeline of, FF, of FFmpeg. Now coming back to transcoding, the post-processed data is fed to a respective encoder. In encoders, the data is compressed into desired formats. The compressed data is then fed to multiplexer. The job of the multiplexer is to combine audio and video elementary streams into desired container format. Later in the slides, I'll show a live example of how FFmpeg does 
transcoding and what kind of command line options can typically be given. So this is basically a, a transcoding pipeline. How how media multimedia file format can be changed using FFmpeg. Moving on to next slide. Another very common use case of FFmpeg is streaming. Now, what is streaming? Streaming is a very popular technology by which multimedia content is delivered continuously from a server to end users. Uh, all of us uh, watch videos over YouTube, so that is also working on, on streaming. So there could be a lot of different constraints which could affect the, the delivery of the content. One is network rate fluctuation. The bandwidth keeps on fluctuating. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. And it also depends upon the client. What kind of a device you're using to view that content. For example, let's say the end user device only supports a particular display resolution or has a limitation on the maximum video bit rate or can only play certain certain media formats or has a CPU which cannot handle and let's say an HD file there could be other things associated with that like power, power consumption so in order to tackle all these constraints we can use FFmpeg adaptive streaming technique is, is another good thing which can be implemented using FFmpeg. What it does is it addresses the problem of difference in data provided to different clients. This streaming protocol supports variable bit rates and depending upon the bandwidth it switches to an optimal bit rate so that the playback experience is smooth, the continuity the continuity is maintained and there is no buffering or lag. One can also do media encryption and user authentication over HTTPS. With this, it allows the publishers to copyright their work, to protect their work. Moving on to the next slide. The combination of FFmpeg and FF server can also be used to provide on-the-fly transcoding. So on-the-fly transcoding means that FFmpeg can receive media input and it can convert this media input as soon as it gets it. So it doesn't need to wait for the entire media content to be downloaded onto the local disk. So so the, the two main advantages which a user will get by doing on-the-fly transcoding is the user doesn't need to transcode the content in advance. It can do it at the runtime. And there will be a lot of time as well as memory saving which will happen by using this on-the-fly transcoding technique. Moreover, there could be scenarios where a user would not want to tinker with the original content. So using this technique, the original content can be transcoded at, at runtime. So this is a very nice feature which can be implemented using FF server and FFmpeg. So, we want to next slide.